All right. Hello, everyone. Can you uh, hear me? Yeah, thank you for coming at today's workshop. Uh, so this is not technically a talk. We'd like to make this as much interactive as we can. So we're going to, um, everything we do, uh, other than the slides, are going to be kind of synchronized with you, if possible. We're going to, you know, hopefully uh, use VS Code with, you know, two keys and, uh, and try to make your job turn faster with system level optimization so you never miss your submission or anything that, okay? Um, so my name is Shin. I'm a research engineer at Sentinel. Uh, previously, I was an AI engineer staff here at Vector. And pre previous to that, I was a researcher under Professor Gennady Pakimenko's lab. And I'm joined with my colleague, Hugo. Um, hi, um, I, I, I am also a research engineer uh, with Jin at Sentinel, uh, and concurrently, I'm also a grad, graduate student at the University of Toronto. Uh, nice to meet you. Yeah. Awesome. So if you haven't heard, Sentinel is a company founded by uh, one of the Vector faculty members. Uh, so we're doing this talk just to show you know, that some observations we had through our research and also some general techniques that we you know, generally use to perform system level operations. Okay, so perhaps the number one question on the computing channel is why are my jobs so slow? Well, besides when the cluster is down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in order to answer that, it's it seems like there's always a reason, but the matter of the fact is to do performance engineering is extremely complex and multifaceted. So to truly identify your uh, job bottleneck, you have to go through many layers. So the first thing you encounter is the job scheduling, right? So you might be simply uh, blocked because you couldn't get an allocation of the job. And then this may not be, you know, your job required that much resource, but you may just kind of requesting a lot more than you actually need. So when you get through at least this first level, even before you use the GPU, when you, whenever you interact with your deep learning training jobs, uh, the, the number one bottleneck that we actually see is host side bottleneck, so which we call you know, CPU side bottlenecks. So even whenever, uh, for example, when you launch a kernel, uh, there's kernel launch overhead and you load data from the disk, your disk IO can block you from using the GPU at all. Uh, and finally, when you're doing data augmentation or when you're doing you know, checkpointing and any other auxiliary logic other than the training, this is a significant amount of bottleneck that we have to remove before we can even start to optimize what we call you know, the GPU side bottlenecks, right? And when we get to the GPU side bottlenecks, things get even more tricky because uh, there you kind of have to do performance engineering with you know, GPUs. You know, uh, with CUDA kernels, uh, with, uh, I, I don't know, like if you're using like TPUs, then you have to deal with XLA compilers and all these complex infrastructure that run on very parallel hardware. So to answer the question of why are my jobs so slow, you kind of have to go through this very rigorous process of figuring out where your bottleneck is and then addressing the most significant bottleneck first, then going into deeper into you know, more advanced or more kind of a, uh, you know, trickier uh, optimizations. And why does it, why does it matter at all, right? Like I write my code and it's as fast as it gets, right? I just wait until it finishes. Uh, as it turns out, you know, having law, uh, very low job throughput is bad for everyone. It's bad for, you know, whoever that owns the resource because it leads to, re because it leads to resource underutilization and waste. Essentially, you're blocking the opportunity of the hardware being used by others. It also blocks you because you would like to, you know, train your jobs faster, publish the next paper, and then report your next results. So it always matters, even if you are not using the GPU. But like, how much can we improve, right? Like, how how much underutilization is there currently in one cluster? Uh, I encourage you to make a guess. Uh, uh, so many of you may aware that there's a there's a GPU stat uh, in the computing channel. 
Uh, so if you aggregate all the GPU utilization and you make an average, um, it's not much. So, well, there's a lot of under utilization going on. So there's not much being used. Uh, so you check, right? This is the past 10 days. Uh, we're averaging about 28% uh, with, you know, hovering between 20 to 40%. So when we ask how much can under utilization cost us, we can say, you know, a lot, right? If you really get to the very top, this is about 3x improvement that you can actually get for everyone's job throughput. So yes, there is a, a like underutilization going on in your jobs that you may not be aware of. Yes? Is that you, you not being requested at all or did you just request it and not use it? Yeah, so if you only count the jobs that are act, like you only average when the jobs are active, average is about 40 to 50%. Okay, so there's still a lot of gap in the that Yeah, yeah. So there are also jobs. So there are kind of cases where job like there isn't enough jobs, but there are also cases where jobs get allocated but never really use the GPU, whether they're aware or not, right? But I guess the bottom line is there is still a lot of optimization opportunities that we can cover. So then how do we do this? Uh, so one way that SentML and our research uh, at U of T focuses on is through system level optimizations. So this doesn't touch any of your training logic. This doesn't do any numerical or uh, kind of algorithmic tweaks. Uh, but essentially what we do is we kind of profile to understand the performance bottlenecks uh, and we optimize the bottlenecks with different techniques uh, available to us. And we kind of iterate you know, whenever you address one bottleneck, some other bottlenecks would appear and then to kind of move on to the next one. And the, the second point may be obvious, uh, but it's actually subtle is to use the right hardware resources in the GPU. Because whenever you run a job, it's not always the best GPU that gives you the best performance in terms of cost, time, and efficiency. Uh, we'll, we'll show you later, but essentially understanding your workload and using the right hardware can also impact uh, a lot. And a disclaimer is that, you know, system level optimizations is a very broad uh, thing. And what we're gonna you know, kind of show present today is fully the surface of all the possible optimizations that one can apply. Okay, so that brings us to our agenda. So we're gonna uh, try to install uh, this VS Code extension. So if you use VS Code, great. We can try to install this together. Um, if not, we can also provide you with uh, a, like a pre-built VM. We're gonna use a few um, open source tools uh, so that can help us understand what's going on in the hardware. Uh, and then we're gonna do uh, some hands-on iterated profiling and optimizations. Uh, Let me introduce six techniques today. Uh, now I'm gonna you know just talk about general optimization ideas followed by a Q and A and discussion. So this is as interactive as um, we can get today. So please feel free to ask any questions. If you hit any problems, let us know. Okay, so we're gonna prepare. Um, I understand that VS Code uh, and the vector cluster was just back up. So uh, we kind of ask you to. Get remote SS access with vector cluster. Uh, I presume that's no longer the case. Uh, so if you have um, your local setup that you have uh, SSH to a lab cluster, uh, you can try follow the docs under uh, follow the documentation under docs.sentinel.ai. Uh, so this is to say if you have remote SSH access with the VS code. Um, and then if you don't have any of that, if you kind of just don't want to, uh, we'll give you a, a VM posted on this link. Uh, okay, so Michael and we're gonna walk around and have everyone set up. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and go to the, to the live demo. Uh, you got it to work, awesome. Thank you for uh, trying this out. Otherwise, uh, just use this VM. So we're gonna open this file called demo.ipad iPython notebook. So it's you know, explore uh, under project demo iPython notebook. Cool. So what is this notebook about? 
Um, so we're going to show you how we profile and optimize a very canonical deep learning training example, uh, ResNet 50 plus C4 100 on PyTorch, right? Uh, so hopefully in the end, we can achieve near 10x improvement. Um, so even though this is like a, you know, more or less a toy example, but the general idea can be you know, applied everywhere. Uh, this just makes it, you know, reasonable time for it to finish. Uh, so how we organize the, this notebook is that we have optimization stages. In each stage, we kind of permute our training pipeline to, you know, to one of the uh, one of the system level optimizations. Uh, so please follow along and notice all the optimization X hashtag uh, for the code changes in each stage. So for the interest of time, we're gonna start the notebook first uh, by clicking run all. So just because the baseline runs quite slowly, so we don't wanna have to wait for it, okay? All right. So we're just doing some very basic uh, imports. So there's, you know, import your model. For data augmentation, we're just going to do, you know, a few uh, transforms. And now we're going to create our data loader, our data set, right? So this is all um, standard practice. Um, and then with the clients, we're in this case, we change for two epochs. Uh, and then we use cross entropy, blah, blah, blah. And then this is our chain function. So none of that is very important because this is all like gotten straight from the PyTorch examples. Um, so if you're interested, take a, take a read. Essentially, just do your forward, backward pass, computer loss, uh, your gradient, and do some logging, right? And for the test function, all you do is just you don't do uh, backward. Uh, and then you just you know, count your accuracy. So this establishes our baseline. Right? Keep in mind, this baseline is not uh, intentionally slower. So this is from like the PyTorch example for training C bar. Uh, we're gonna declare our train, uh, train loader and validation loader with batch size of 128. Uh, so this will run for two epochs. And we just report the training throughput for the second epoch to account for any noise that we introduced in the first epoch for uh, setting up noise and stuff. Okay, so we use TQPM to report training progress. So here you can see that it's training and it's, you know, slightly have lower loss as time go by. Uh, and it reports the iteration per second for, you know, for your training. So nothing here is uh, special. Uh, so your model optimizer, learning rate scheduler, train for two epochs, and uh, report the second epoch. Any questions at this point? Okay, so this is just a very canonical image net on like C4 100 training with ResNet 50, right? Everything is gotten from Torch Vision, uh, uh, and we just follow the example. And then this establishes our baseline, which takes about 70 seconds for each epoch. So what does that mean, right? Without like, uh, without proper uh, profile or without any comparison, this number doesn't really make any sense because is it too fast, too slow? Uh, we don't know. This is why uh, oftentimes, if you encounter a new workload, first thing you do is to profile it. So by profiling, we mean to understand at any given time what the code is doing, right? Where it's spending its time. Um, so in this case, we're going to use a built-in PyTorch profiler just because it's easy to use. But in practice, you might want to use some fancier or some you know uh, vendor-specific profilers such as V2 or Insign Systems. Uh, but they become even harder to use as you go deeper into the analysis. Uh, so the profile, we essentially just do this um, uh, torch style profile. So this is a context manager. We put whatever we want to profile in the uh, indented, indented block. So this has a bunch of flags. 
Uh, so for in this case, we're profiling both the CPU and GPU activity. Uh, we uh, you know we put our chain function there, and then it'll say you know whether it's profiling and then it's done. So once when this finishes, uh, but so when you profile the it's gonna run really slow, but uh, the code the, like the profile results should faithfully report what it would run. You know when you actually run it without the profile. So we want to try to open the profile results. So we're going to open what's called a command palette. View command palette. And you search launch tensor board. And Note that we put our profile results under profile baseline. So you say select another folder, profile. All make sense? And we click OK. You can choose to open this in browser or not. Uh, so. Okay, so actually, before we do this, we're going to have to. So there's one extra command called select interpreter. Uh, we'll view connect palette. Type on select interpreter. So we're going to use the conda interpreter. Okay. And then we do launch tensor board. So, first select the interpreter and then launch tensor board. Over. So this should, should open something like this. If it, you know, try to make it work. Uh, but if not, you can just, you know, view this with me. So this is not like mission critical. So what this is, is the profile results for one iteration of our training. Uh, as you can see in the summary page, it's gotten our GPU, our utilization, Stands about you know thirty five percent, and there's a lot of information, right? But the key information to look is that you know we have thirty five percent in the kernel, some in the CPU, some in other. But even this is not informative, right? You just know kind of time is spent somewhere, but you don't know exactly what's going on. So in in this uh, PyTorch profiler, where we can go is. There's this trace view. So under this trace view, uh, what it shows is that, you know, across time, at any given time, what your code is doing, whether it's running some operator, loading data, et cetera, et cetera. So by the way, this is like very difficult to use. Um, it doesn't have like, yeah, you can't drag this unless you. Okay. So there's two key information you can read from profile results. Uh, the first key information is down bottom. So you have your GPU, right? And it shows GPU zero utilization. And then if you move it around, you can see that for this is one iteration of your training. In the very in about half of the time, you're not using any GPU. Half the time you're not using any GPU. And even when you are, you're not using them efficiently because of the gaps that you can see here. I hope you can see the gaps. So the profiler essentially lets you to do this, right? Without the profiler, you don't know what's going on in your code. 
but now you can at least say, okay, there's a bunch of stuff that goes on before my GPU is even getting used. And then what is this stuff, right? You might want to zoom in. And then you see here, torch details data. Then you realize, okay, so this is the data, right? Now you kind of move around. Okay, so what happens if I go past my data loader? Then it shows something about you know torch module, uh, and then you know, forward, and then this is a bunch of you know hidden layers. Then there's this one giant function called uh, torch autogram, right? For people who work with PyTorch. Day and night, you know, this autograd engine in the backward. But then all it shows is torch autograd. You don't know which operator in the backward pass is taking most of the time because you know backward pass is usually two times as slower as your forward pass, right? If you're using you know, uh, the autograd, what's the term? Using vector decomposition product. Uh, so this is as much as the profiler can give you at this point. But the bottom line here is that, okay, our data loading is taking an enormous amount of time when it usually shouldn't, right? Usually your data loader can go pre-fetch stuff. Uh, your data loader can have multiple you know, concurrent workers. Uh, so you shouldn't have to wait for this. And the second takeaway is if you look at the, the GPU efficiency, it's really sparse. It means that, you know, Every pink line here is my GPU is actually doing work. And any other time the GPU is not doing work. But you can like, if you have time and like interest, you can like even zoom in more to see what's actually going on. For example, the efficiency is low for this kernel and you end up you know, optimizing for this kernel alone. So this becomes very hardcore you know, CUDA program, right? But the bottom line is, uh, in order to profile, we can understand what the, what the code is actually doing. Okay, now let's hop back to our notebook. If you may. So now we've established with a profiler that first, our code is very slow. And second, the biggest part from the slowness is the data loop. So naturally, we start our first optimization on data loading. You might think, okay, so the first thing is to increase the number of workers. It's actually not that. So in your data augmentation pipeline, right, whether you're using uh, Torch Vision augmentation, like all these libraries, you usually kind of stack your transforms in this uh, sequence of transforms, right? And the fact is the order of this transforms actually matter. Even though they may be uh, they may be mathematically equivalent, but if you put some transforms up in the front, uh, it actually runs a lot faster. So in the code before, we did all of our you know, random crop flip Gaussian blur, and then we cast it to tensor. But if we upfront convert uh, our image to tensor first, and then we do all these transforms because. Now everything is done as PyTorch tensors, which have better implementation in general. Uh, just this alone can get us, you know, twelve percent optimization, right? You know, without you changing any code, but just moving your data augmentation sequences around. You know, it's more severe if you did some sort of like crop and then do some other things. So you should always do the crop and almost like reduction things first because you know otherwise they kind of do a lot of uh, wasteful work so first always uh, be mindful of all the data loading steps uh, you have and the second is kind of common knowledge um, i bring it up here because by default pytorch does not turn these on right so there's a, a, a few flags uh, pin memory uh, non workers, which stand for whether you want to pre-batch the data, and you know what, how to select the best, uh, the best batch size. Um, so, essentially, in this data loader class, there's pin memory and number of workers. By default, pin memory is false; number of workers zero. 
So when a zero data loading happens first, and then you do your uh, training iteration. But uh, this doesn't have to be the case because you've got mo multiple CPUs on your uh, on your workstation, and you can always have asynchronous data loading workers to go first. And the rule of thumb is the number of workers should be one uh, should be the number of CPUs you have minus one. Why minus one? Because the main worker, the worker that actually trains the GPU, uh, takes one core. So all the rest, if you're not running anything else, should be used for data loading. It might not increase your performance until some point, but this is like the recommended to at least give the hint uh, to the data loading stage. And then pin memory is whenever using GPU, there's a special place for uh, for the CPU to copy stuff around. And if you use pin memory, this avoids one copy uh, from CPU to CPU. It's not like that big, but it's always good to have. So this is our second optimization, still unavailable. Uh, and then many of you know about this. And the third is that we realized that we're not using a lot of memory, uh, so we increase the batch size. But when you do increase the batch size, also make sure you change your hyperparameters because uh, they don't come for free, right? So we were at 1.12, now we're at 2.98, right? So data loading is very important. Before you like looking at the GPU code, always make sure that you're not bottlenecked by the data loading. Because in many times, especially on vector cluster, so I should I should mention on vector cluster, even if you set number of workers to greater than one, it might not work. You know why? Uh, so the reason is that if your uh, file server is really slow, multiple concurrent requests end up being sequential to the file server trying to load data from your uh, into your, uh, your RAM and ends up on the GPU. So one recommendation I have is if you have a rather smaller data set, you know, CFAR or Omnigod or MNIST, just cache them in your CPU. Like you, 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 you materialize the data in a list and then you pass that to the data loader. So this should avoid uh, additional trips to the, to the disk. Right. Uh, just uh, something to think about. Uh, you know, if the cluster was up and running, and I can show you how this can have like severe impact. But just keep in mind, you know, they, uh, loading from the disk can be really, really slow, and you should be mindful when whenever you're doing uh, data loading. Okay. So the third one is called mixed precision training. Uh, this used to be uh, a bit risky given the hardware. Uh, so, uh, so essentially, NVIDIA kind of publishes new hardware every year. And then uh, there, they used to be have uh, something called tensor cores on these GPUs, which can calculate matrix multiplications extremely fast. But they have to be in specific data types. It used to be uh, floating point 16 bit floating point numbers, so FP16. Uh, in the newer generation, since A100, um, even if you use something called uh, TensorFlow 32, you can also uh, use these tensor cores. So, using tensor cores versus not using tensor cores makes a huge difference if your model has a lot of matrix multiplications and convolutions. So, in the case of BERT or CNNs, uh, you should always try to use mixed precision training. Uh, why not like always use mixed precision training is because this does count at a cost of potential numerical uh, reduction of precision loss. Uh, just as you, you all know, if you use like doubles for everything, that like, everything would work great, but no one does that because it's way too slow. So if you try to use mixed precision training, you may encounter uh, convergence differences from you know, uh, flow 32. So there's a few tricks. Uh, luckily, this is all integrated to PyTorch right now. Um, so to enable mixed precision training, uh, the, the first thing you do is your, uh, you wrap your forward function. So outputs equals model inputs by this torch.autocast. Device type in this case will be CUDA. 
because we have a GPU available. So that's the first, right? You only, all you need to do is um, put your code under torch.autocast device equal CUDA. So this will try to use TensorCore whenever possible. So things like matrix multiplications and convolutions. And because we might have precision loss, there's something called gradient scaling. So how this works probably requires a lot more time to elaborate. But on a very high level, this tries to compensate for any precision loss you incurred when you do autocast, when you do mixed precision training, right? So ideally, after this gradient scalar, you kind of recover the same loss that you would have with 32-bit uh, full throughput numbers, but now with much, much uh, better performance. So that will be the second optimization that we do, gradient scalar. Uh, and the third one is you cast your model. This is specifically for image models. There's uh, a special memory format called channels loss. So this, again, because tensor cores requires you to load uh, contiguous memory where channels in the last dimension. So if you do this ahead of time, the extra conversion at runtime will be gone. So you cast this for channels loss for image models. Uh, avoids you some of the you know, data transpositions that are needed. And some minor things is, you know, torch and benchmark and deterministic. If you don't really care about like 100% reproducibility, right? If you do care about 100% reproducibility, you should set deterministic to be true. But a benchmark should always be true because what this does is it just, before it runs any of your uh, code, it tries to find a few alternatives and I'll pick the best alternative for your specific uh, workload. So this two flags um, uh, should be uh, set accordingly. And now we're at that 3.61. Um, so mixed precision in general can give you up to 2x performance. The reason we're only seeing from you know, uh, 3x to 3.6x is because our model is relatively small. So when our model is small, it doesn't have a lot of heavy matrix multiplications. Uh, so we're only seeing like a, a little bit of performance. Gain. This time 3.6 from where we started. Okay. So the next next optimization is called used optimizing. Uh, so if Anyone here at Vector should know what Optimizer does and how it does things, right? So if you're using Atom, for every weight tensor, it'll do some scaling, do some uh, bookkeeping, and then it, it, you know, it updates your uh, uh, parameters based on your gradients, right? Uh, so how this is implemented on the GPU is that it launches one kernel for every weight tensor, right? So a model usually has weight tensor of size hundreds to thousands. Uh, so that's hundreds of thousands of kernels, all doing a very simple calculation, scaling, multiplication, and writing back in memory. So what ends up happening is that all these operations kind of end up spending most of the time launching kernels, but very little time doing any useful work. Uh, and you know, it didn't have to be this case because you know that your parameters don't change across training iterations. Not the, the parameters change, so their memory locations don't change, right? It's still the same tensor. And the number of operations also don't change. So you can essentially fuse this optimizer update to a single kernel launch or to you know, a few kernel launches, uh, such that the overhead of launching kernels is much, much less. Does that make sense? So uh, fused optimizer is provided through uh, a library called Apex. So it's like a NVIDIA maintained extension. Uh, uh, and because we're using NVIDIA GPUs, this is our goal choice. And then what you do is fairly simple, right? Uh, instead of using Atom, you know, you use, you use Apex.optimizers use Atom. Now, if you don't use Atom, use like very fancy uh, optimizers, they may or may not have any implementation for this. But if you're using like traditional SGB atom, uh, this is available. And this actually gives you a very good performance boost. Um, if you check back in the tensor board, our optimizer update actually took a very long time. 
Uh, right, it took about as much time as your forward and backward motion. So this is optimizer of it. By the way, like, as you can imagine, uh, the optimization is within think out of the blue. So you always have to refer back to your profile results and then come back and make the change. Uh, it's just that you know, uh, we'd like to go through this special instead of always going back to profile and then uh, to you know, optimize this. So with the fuse optimizer, we're sitting at 5.41, right? So we're at 3.6, now we're at uh, 5.41. So that's, again, another big uh, boost of performance. Uh, the next optimization is called torch.jit. Uh, so JIT stands for just-in-time compile. Uh, so this, again, is like very common uh, in PyTorch. It's like a very popular API. So uh, what this does is like, you know, there's a lot of math in some calculations of your model. Um, and then again, because of the kernel launch, every element-wise operator or like, I don't know, addition uh, would result in one kernel launch. So torch.jit will try to you know, group all these uh, mathematical operations and try to compile them into a single kernel, plus additional optimizations like you know, constant folding or uh, simplifying the expression, all these things. You, you don't have to like care too much. Just know that if your model involves a lot of uh, simple math, so like does a lot of like add multiplication, square root, all these things, uh, you can use uh, torch.jit. And uh, for the best performance, uh, you should also set draw plus equal to true so that all of your batch is identical uh, across the entire grid block. This is not strictly required, but it's always beneficial. So how we use JIT in this context, we will just uh, make your model uh, with first.jit.trace, and you pass in the data that you plan to use when you're training. So this won't work for dynamic shapes, because as you can imagine, you kind of uh, made a promise to torch.jit that you're going to only use this shape for your input. So if this shape changes, it'll trigger a recompile and it'll be slower than just random as is. Uh, so then you get your trace model, and then you just use your trace model as is. It's supposed to be you know, mathematically equivalent. So this gives us a little bit of performance boost. Now we're at 5.73. Right, so we're used to be 5.41. So, given that this comes for free, yeah. unless it breaks your code, I would also encourage you to just try this out. And finally, again, because we're using NVIDIA GPUs, uh, there's something called CUDA graph. Uh, so, following the thought of kernel launches, uh, every time you ask the GPU to do some work, you have to ask it first. So what we will call this is kernel launch. You prepare your input arguments, uh, you know, and then you kind of say, hey, launch this kernel, and it'll launch this kernel, uh, and then it's done, right? And then this, this operation of launching the kernel can be as costly as the kernel itself if your model size is really small. Uh, and what CUDA graph uh, does in this context is that because deep learning training is extremely iterative, in every iteration it's the same sequences of operations uh, launched one after another. So there's really no need to you know do this every time you know like oh launch this kernel, launch that kernel, blah blah blah, right? So CUDA graph essentially captures one iteration of your training as a graph of how your program behaves, right? So that next time you try to train your next iteration of your model, you just replace that graph. So this avoids any of that kernel launch overhead. Also any of the CPUs that overhead that you haven't have any. That means like, you know, asking Python to run this segment of code. Um, does that make sense? So the way you do this is 
a API called Workshop CUDA make graph callables. Uh, if you're using, in addition with uh, automatic mixed precision, this call must be also under auto test it's because you know whenever it generates a CUDA graph, uh, you know it has to be the same operations when you're actually training it. And again, you're you're providing the inputs of the shape. <clears throat> Uh, shape of the inputs uh, to your graph. And this implies that this also only works with static shapes. Because, you know, uh, because how code graph works for a uh, short yeah, some explanation. Uh, but after that, it's the same way you use your model. So your forward and backward functions work as is. Uh, and it's supposed to be mathematically equivalent because you don't actually change the implementation. All you do is uh, remove the kernel launch overhead. So with this, we arrive at about 8.3x speed up from where we started. Um, so if you were using uh, uh, you know the same uh, different VM uh, VMs, you might see a different number because you know the measurements can be noisy. Uh, but you should be seeing something like 89 minutes, right? So these are kind of the common tricks, uh, and most of these don't really affect your uh, numerical or convergence behavior. Uh, and uh, I, I hope I convinced you that there's still a lot of opportunities you can optimize for your model if you're just running PyTorch as is, uh, eager mode PyTorch. Uh, Great, but how we got here is not as trivial as it looks because every operation here requires you a trip to the profiler, identifying where it was slow, and then a trip back through the code to make the change, and then verifying that you actually did uh, what you, you know, expected to, to do. So this is a very iterative process. And to our defense, TensorFlow wasn't the best tool that we were, um, you know, we had in mind, which is we, which is why we tried to uh, ask you to install this uh, profiler uh, called Skyline, uh, which our colleague Yubo will have presented. This point, any questions? Yeah. So, like when you mentioned the drop last for the batch size, because I guess like the batch size could be lower than when you set it up. Will Torch actually like throw you an error or will it just silently recompile the back then? So for torch.jit, it'll recompile. For CUDA graph, it'll just throw you an error. Okay, so Torch given like saying. Yeah, TorchJIT has some metadata about like what this kernel is compiled for what shape. So if it sees a different shape, same kernel, it'll just like oh. in my experience, but it'll be really slow. Okay. Because you'll recompile it. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, so, so now I'm going to. Uh, try to demo a tool that we have uh, developed uh, called Skyline uh, that hopefully helps you streamline your process of iterative uh, optimization, uh, model optimization. So, um, so, uh, so in your um, VS Code environment, there's a file called model.py. So this is uh, precisely the same model that you have just used by uh, right And um, in addition to that, in, in entry point of UI, there are some definitions um, on uh, what essentially this will tell a uh, skyline, uh, what the model is, uh, what your input will look like, uh, as well as what a training iteration looks like. So, so this helps us tell our tool um, uh, what, what, what is happening when you uh, try to train your model. So I guess we'll begin by, by starting our tool. So. Uh, if you go to the command palette, so under the hamburger menu at the top, go to view and command palette, and in the list, let's select uh, Skyline. Um, and so, so the first thing you will see here is uh, Skyline will ask you where is your project. So, uh, so your project should be under workspace, vector workshop, and then project if you're using our VMs. Um, if you're using the vector cluster, that should be at a similar uh, location. So after we did that, we can click OK and here comes the Skyline window. Um, we have seen that some instances it has connection failed. In that case, just click reconnect and I'll show you uh, this, this uh, thing over here. 
So uh, once I click uh, analyze, uh, so what, what Skyline does now is it's going to profile your model and try to generate instance. Um, specifically, it's going to run your model multiple times uh, with different back sizes, look at what different operations you use, um, and also uh, has uh, generates some recommendations for you to increase the training of your models. Um, because here we are um, also profiling the data loader, uh, this will take a little longer. This will take around a minute. Uh, but the, in a second, once we uh, get to some of the later optimizations, we can uh, profile the model itself, which will make this process go a lot faster. Um, so in this segment, we're going to apply many of the same optimizations that we did introduce, uh, except now we're going to do this um, you're going to look at how this tool will help us identify these bottlenecks uh, and hopefully make this process smoother for you if you want to optimize your models. Uh, so we have seen that. Now, now we see this window on the right. So this is uh, the Skyline interface. Uh, so it's still doing some analysis, but uh, what we can see here, first of all, is this bar on the left. So this shows us where our time is going to. So this is serves sort of a similar purpose as the pipe virtual model. So, so the first thing we observe here is this large section called and track and it's taking 72 milliseconds. Uh, so this would include anything that's not sort of what we call computation. Right? So this would be your whatever time your framework takes, uh, or in this case, uh, a lot of it comes from the data loader. So to uh, so we're gonna do our first optimization, which is um, in our data loader, let's move the two tensor call to the first. To, to the first uh, stage of our pipeline. So to do that, let's uh, comment up the original definition for the transform train function uh, pipeline, and then let's uh, yeah, and then let's uh, uncomment this one uh, under step number one. Right. So um, after this, uh, what, what Skyline will tell you is. Um, well, uh, it's going to tell you, oh, I found some uh, changes in your project, and then um, do you want to reprofile your project? So, so now once we do that, it's going to essentially repeat the process and show us what the updated times are. Um, are there any questions with uh, Skyline? And the, did anyone uh, have trouble finding it? Uh, okay, uh, perfect. So, so I guess it, it's uh, perhaps nice to uh, see. Oh, I shouldn't have closed it. Okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, so remember the bar on the left uh, on the slide, skyline interface, it will show you your time decomposition. Uh, specifically, it's going to show you uh, where your time went to, uh, which layers it went to specifically. So uh, let's contrast that with uh, TensorFlow. Uh, we're going to uh, so taking a look at TensorBoard, we see a few uh, few major sections. We see data loader, then we see forward and backward pass. Right? So, but, but then if you want to understand what happens during your forward and backward pass, it becomes very difficult. Right? So suppose I want to look at our forward pass. Let's uh, zoom in here. Right? This is well, you see uh, four major modules. So the, these are you think of these as like these are modules of the Redneck uh, model. But so anything after that, it's very painful to look at, right? Like, so what is this stuff? <laughs> uh, and, and so, first of all, it's very hard to extract uh, in, useful information from this hierarchical graph. And uh, although it shows you the line numbers, uh, model of high line number six, uh, it's I, I don't think anyone wants to go uh, one by one to look at each line um, in, in Skyline. So uh, in, in, in the tensor board, uh, but with Skyline. Um, uh, it shows you this comedic uh, decomposition of runtime, uh, specifically how long it takes for forward and backward. Um, and you can actually double click on one of these bars, and it's going to take you to the part of the code that, that incurred this time. Right? So you can hover over each one of these, look at how many times it's, it's been invoked. And for each of these invocations, it tells you uh, how much time it's been on forward and backward, as well as how much memory used. And the, the, the deeper the color is here, the, the more time it's in the box. Okay, so down here, these are our four major layers. Uh, you can see the time here. Right? And, and uh, I guess uh, what's especially bad with TensorBoard is not with the forward pass, it's with the backward pass. In the forward pass, you see this hierarchical structure, but in the backward pass, well, you don't actually see anything. Well, you see um, 
it says backward, right? And then the only thing you see are the individual operations. So there's no way to refer back to report code. There's no way to make sense what happens, but Skyline gives you this uh, statistics on what precisely, how much time precisely each there is for backward. Right, so you can hover over these individual parts and then look at uh, so here you can uh, make sense of like what exactly is happening when I create my model, right? which layer is taking the most time or most time. Um, so let's uh, apply our uh, so let's apply our second optimization, which is uh, increasing our uh, batch. So to do to do that, let's comment out line sixty three, where it says uh, get data uh, get loader, and also comment out line seventy seven to five. So these three lines. Uh, so this will do what this will do is it will let Skyline take over uh, loading the data. So we won't profile the data loader um, uh, uh, any. So here you can see uh, it went from I believe it was 70 something milliseconds down to 59 milliseconds. So that will do uh, the performance gains we got from uh, moving the shoot sensor call to the top. So let's again let's so I guess this is what Presidente uh, Shiv meant uh, when he said uh, iterative, uh, like profile, uh, performance optimization is an iterative process, right? We want to uh, look at uh, bottlenecks we wanna, and then uh, find ways to locate the bottleneck here. So uh, at this time, it got well, that's right. Uh, so next, let's turn our uh, attention to this section that the peak memory music and throughput. So one of the things that Skyline will do during profiling is going to run your model with different batch sizes. And I've actually identified that we're not fully utilizing the GPU because we are uh, using a small, relatively small batch size in this case four. Right? So you can actually drag these bars up and down. Right? So, you can, um, so it, it shows you that uh, you're only getting like half of the maximum possible uh, throughput. Uh, so what if we try with something larger, like 16 over here? Change our uh, batch size to 16, then can start our profile. So this would give you sort of an interpolation of uh, what batch size would maximize your training. But obviously, as a machine learning researcher, it is up, ultimately up to you to decide if this is good for my uh, convergence. So, uh, but what we can tell you is, you know, you could increase your batch size to make it. A better utilization of both the GPU and the GPU. Now we see this uh, bar down a lot higher. Um, so, I guess in the interest of time, uh, we're going to perform uh, two more optimizations that Jane showed. Uh, that, uh, the first one is automatic mixed precision. So, so, to enable that, uh, that's uncommon uh, line 86, where it says AMP uh, over here. Uh, and in addition to that, let's uh, comment, let's uh, indent the next two lines uh, 88 and 89. So this would essentially, so remember our current our throughput is 238. So let's see what happens after we make this change. Okay, so this is actually perhaps a satisfying process. You make changes to your code um, and then you see the number get uh, higher and higher uh, as you make uh, additional optimizations. So I, I hope that uh, you would agree that this is would be slightly nicer to use than, than Skyline. Uh, and the problem that we see with Skyline is the gradient layer. You see too much stuff where you don't, uh, no, sorry, uh, answer for it. Uh, if you see too much, too, too much information uh, or it doesn't show you any useful information at all. Right? So that, with Skyline, we aim to show you just the right amount of information to, uh, to for you to make sense of where your bottom is. Right? So now we went from 200 something uh, to 474. Um, and the last one we're going to do is student optimizer, uh, which is on line 63. So let's replace the definition for optimizer from uh, portal optim.fge to choose uh, M. In fact, we should have used M here, but we shouldn't make a difference. Right, so let's reprofile and. So this would replace the torch optimizer with the uh, one from Apex. Uh, which is the same that uh, Shin demonstrated. So you can see that we're making all of these changes in the entry point of GUI. So this is what defines your training, uh, uh, your training process, your iteration, training iteration process. So this tells Skyline what you want to do, uh, but when you want to integrate these changes, you have to uh, change the according uh, lines in your training code. Uh, 
so we have strong 63, which is not as big of a improvement. Uh, but it seems like we can perhaps increase our throughput again uh, by using a larger batch size because, in addition to saving time, AMP also saves some memory. So let's use maybe 64. Uh, let's use 32. Uh, so you should see a slightly bigger throughput. Okay. Anyway, um, so I, I guess. Uh, since we're a little short on time, uh, this is this will be the last optimization we're going to do with Skyline. But uh, in addition to um, the profiling features, it will also tell you about other things like uh, you know uh, people care about how much environmental impact that your project has. Right. Um, so it's doing that prediction. Um, so this is going to tell you exactly how much energy your training workload uses and help you quantify you know how much environmental impact uh, that your Training work like people say, like machine learning kills trees, right? Now you can know precisely how many trees. <laughs> uh, right. So, you can see, um, if I train 400,000 acres of kilowatts of energy, um, so what, one thing I want to say is uh, so on this cloud instance, we actually can't get CPU memory usage, but if you're running this on your local workstation, then this would also show you uh, precisely how much your CPU and DRAM uses as well. And the center, you can see that. You know, instead of training your model, you put the chart for smartphone five times. Uh, and it also tells you relative to our other experiments how much uh, your current one is. So you can see if it's going up or going down. So uh, this is uh, what we mean by like uh, system level optimizations. But I think there's one point that you mentioned in the beginning uh, that we haven't really touched it, uh, which is like finding the right, using the right hardware, right? So this is the second point that we want to uh, discuss. So um, okay, so um, a question you might ask is uh, once I have optimized my model, why don't I just use the best GPU there is, right? And make sure that'll be an 840 on GTP, maybe an A100 or the uh, Hopper line of GPUs that's coming up, right? But it, it turned out that this is not always the case, right? Um, you might have, uh, but like due to the nature of your model or your input, you might actually underutilize the GPU. Uh, so these two plots show uh, why this is the runtime uh, uh, training throughput of your of your um, one iteration. So you can actually see if I use a smaller input here, uh, it actually doesn't make too much of a difference between uh, a very powerful GPU like A100 versus the T4, right? Uh, but on the right, if I use a slightly larger um, image, uh, it, it starts to make a difference, right? Uh, so this is an example of uh, if you have a small input that underutilizes the GPU. You can also have small models, right? So on that left is compact small, uh, small. On the right is compact large with the same input size. But one, it makes it makes sense to use a better GPU, and on the other, it doesn't. Other way around. Uh, so uh, the, the the thing that powers this uh, uh, is called a uh, uh, habitat, which is integrated with Skyline, which is a tool that you can use just now. Right. So uh, you might, during like deadline season, you might have uh, a long queue for in the 840s, right? Everyone wants the best GPUs, but does it really make sense to spend uh, an hour waiting for the GPU, right? Uh, some Skyline will tell you, uh, sort of Habitat will tell you um, instantaneously if it does make sense to, to, to wait for it. Does your job really benefit uh, from uh, a GPU with larger compute capacity? And this helps you, instead of you having to benchmark your model on your GPUs, this will tell you right away how long it will take. So this is actually integrated in the Skyline tool that we just introduced uh, here. So uh, here, uh, we actually see uh, traditions for different GPUs. We recently added some newer ones on like 840. Uh, you can see uh, these are the predictions that Habitat um, is mentioned. In addition to that, if you want to train on the cloud, uh, this will also show you a list of cloud instances, uh, how long it will take and how much it will cost you if you choose to go that route. These are different uh, GPUs and different cloud instances. It will show you this plot. Uh, simply like substitute in your time and budget constraints, and it's going to tell you which one you should go with. Uh, so currently, we support, support these GPUs, so anywhere from the Pascal generation all the way to uh, M share. Uh, we hope to support H100, which is currently the most powerful uh, server grade GPU soon. Um, uh, so, but, but all the popular ones like the 3090, A100, A40, uh, T4, uh, which a lot of people use, are available. So, if you have a workstation that has a 2080 Ti, then now you can use Habitat to generate predictions for, for other GPUs that you might want to deploy on. And uh, 
habitat is we, we tested this on a set of standard workloads, and then generally you get an error less than ten percent. So you, you can sort of trust these uh, predictions that habitat is. Um, and this is uh, shown as close to the cloud. You can use this to uh, look at which is on happens. And, and the bottom left, I might add, is uh, customized to a particular model. So some models it makes sense to go for the better GPU. Uh, because it, it costs, uh, well, while it costs more, it's a lot faster, but some it doesn't really make sense for you to spend out all the extra money, or you can go for a, a P4 or something. So um, we are actually in the process of uh, rebranding some of this stuff. Uh, so we want to call that, we want to call these two tools as part of a larger suite uh, called DPU, um, and has two major components, Skyline and Habitat Skyline, is a uh, iterative uh, Interactive profiler that we just use in Habitat is one that generates uh, prediction. Uh, but uh, the, the stuff that we have shown you today only sort of scratches the surface of the, the, the state of level of prediction in you your models. So I guess I'll hand it back to my colleague, uh, Shin, to talk about some additional cool optimizations we can uh, use. So, thanks. Thank you for the demo. So, uh, in any case, for research workflows, uh, what we realize at Vector is that a lot of the models are small because mostly we care about uh, trying on smaller scale experiments. Um, and just uh, scaling batch size isn't enough. So, you can also try uh, one technique called horizontal fusion, which enables sharing multiple training jobs on a single GPU more effectively. So instead of having multiple cards, now you have one card that trains all these uh, configurations together on any hardware. So this kind of like a batch size, but in terms of the model, because you never really train a single model. Usually you do convergence analysis, you do uh, hyperparameter tuning. So this allows you to batch the model effectively, um, which gives you similar uh, Performance gains if you increase your batch size, but in that case, you cannot increase the batch size. And if you care about inference, uh, I, I'm not too sure uh, you know, how many of our researchers care about hosting things, but uh, uh, there's all these awesome tensor compilers around. So, one of them that uh, we are actually uh, championing is an open source compiler called HiDet. So, if you've heard of uh, perhaps TensorRT or TDM, uh, HiDat is, in fact, a lot more performant uh, in a lot of the usual use cases. And then we have a pretty good integration with Torch Dynamo, which comes in iTorch 2.0. Uh, so if you've heard of the Torch Compile uh, news, uh, this will be one of the supported backends that uh, we are currently working on. Um, so this is, again, open source, and you can, uh, you know, if you're interested, try it out. Uh, so all you need is a PyTorch model, and then uh, you can uh, compile instead of using, you know, CUDA version, Indian versions, uh, the tensor program that runs a lot faster than uh, uh, you used to have you know, with the Python. For this, uh, I'm concluding my uh, our workshop. Um, also, please feel free to uh, you know give us a star or you know to our open source projects uh, if you like our tools and uh, reach us out any time. Uh, so, any questions? <laughs>